The Albanese government is now freaking. It fa faces a by-election Victorian seat of Dunkley in just over a month. Should be a cinch for the Labor Party's 6% margin. But there are people screaming out there about the cost of living. So Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has called an emergency meeting in Canberra on Wednesday of all his MPs to talk about what to do. What we'll be looking at, of course, is the advice that we've received about how we can take pressure off cost of living for people who are doing it tough without putting pressure on inflation. Look, that's all very good, but didn't Albanese boast in the election campaign just a year and a half ago that he already had a plan to cut our cost of living? What can you do to actually reduce the cost of lettuce and, and even on a day like Mother's Day, the cost of flowers, Mr Albanese? Well, what you can do is have a plan to address cost of living issues. And that's why we've put forward uh, practical plans, uh, ones that will make a difference for uh, working families. Our plan, uh, which consists of powering Australia for cheaper energy. <laughs> a plan for cheaper energy. Which wall did that hit? Joining me is the panel, Michael Kroger, former president of the Victorian Liberal Party, and David Hughes, head of the Menzies Research Centre. David, let me start with you. Uh, a summit of Labor MPs uh, going to Canberra. Uh, that's going to cost uh, nearly half a million dollars in airfares and, allowance, and allowances, uh, accommodation. Is it a good idea? The Prime Minister says, oh, a lot of them would be there anyway. But this is just going to be two weeks before the return of Parliament anyway. Well, yes, Andrew, our politicians spend a lot of time in Canberra, as it is. Now, this is a difficult task. This is the most difficult of all tasks for governments to deal with cost of living pressures and inflation. And we saw detailed plans from Labor at the 2019 election, and they lost that election. The public was spooked. So at the last election, we didn't see a whole lot of detail. We saw promises that this would be cheaper and that would be cheaper. Now, the detailed solution here is very complex and very difficult to achieve. If you want to ease cost of living pressures but not increase inflation, there's very few levers that the Commonwealth Government can pull. The main one, as Angus Taylor may have yeah, said, but the government, said but, earlier, but I'm saying this spending. bloke, this bloke promised it. This bloke promised he had a plan a year and a half ago. It's gone nowhere. The energy price has, in fact, rocketed through the roof. And now he says, oh, look, in two weeks' time, he's going to have a rush meeting of his MPs to come uh, th think of something. Plan B. I mean, Michael, <laughs> by the way, congratulations on your reports last week from Israel. Oh, I thought you. they were fantastic. Thank you. But what do you think of this? Look... In 2016, Bill Shorten lied and almost won the unwinnable election, OK, over Medi the Medicare. In 2019, he told the truth and lost. So in 222, Albanese, they thought, bugger it, I'm just going to say whatever I need to say to get elected. I've got a plan for a cost of living. He had no plan, no tears. All he had, Andrew, was a few words from the advertising agency which said, say this over and over and over again. He also had the other thing he said was that he's implementing the voice in full. Uh, he regrets that too. So these things have caught up with him. He has no plan. He has no idea. He's not interested in economics. He's just like Whitlam in that regard. And now all the people in the Teal seats who voted for, voted for the Teal members and then voted for The Voice, well, they're going to get clobbered on Wednesday. Well, if, this, if the results of the last year and a half have been the results of his first plan, I'd hate to know what the second one looks like. Uh, but, David, uh, there are reports today. Yeah, it's funny, you, you know, he's very worried about the cost of living, but then the reports is going to overhaul the Stage 3 tax cuts. But that, he means, people over 180000 they're going to see their promised tax cut slashed by people, uh, slashed by a few thousand dollars. Uh, this is despite bracket creep you know, making them pay more and more and more over the, what is it, eight years since we last got a tax cut. Meanwhile, people under 180000 they're going to get a little bit more. Now, the government isn't actually denying this, not explicitly. Smart move or not? Well, where there's smoke, there's fire, and we've heard reports that Labor are looking <laughs> back away from these tax cuts for some time. Look... $180,000 is a lot of money, but if you're a family on a single income, you, you, you're often doing it tough, um, even, on, even on that income in our major capital cities. There's 600,000 people, over 600,000 people currently uh, paying that uh, top level of tax, and that's soon to rise to around a million people. 
Uh, this is all because of bracket creep, of course. We are a high tax country people. in Australia. I'm not sure people people realise that. There's a hundred. Our analysis shows that there's around 118 countries over the world with lower headline rates of taxation, income taxation, than Australia. Yeah, but the thing is, uh, Michael, uh, Albanese desperately needs the money. He's spent like a drunken sailor. Um, it seems he'd rather break a promise than, uh, you know, make spending cuts. Well, a lot of those people in those teal seats and Liberal seats are not voting for him. So he's thinking, I want to do whatever I can do to get re-elected. I mean, this bloke, this bloke will say and do anything to get re-elected. That's, that's the problem. And uh, But this is, uh, all this is in preparation for the Dunkley by-election, isn't it? That's, that's the rush to get that's, MPs... That, that's, to... Why, that's why he's doing it now, OK? That's why he's doing it now. Last week we were told that there was something coming in the May budget. We had to wait till then. But now this has come forward. Look... This guy never had a plan. He never had an idea. He's never produced the modelling for the $275 energy cut. Wouldn't you love to see that? Wouldn't you love that to be forensically anal analysed to say, well, that was a false promise you made. You had no justification for making that promise. Yeah, this is all about Dunkley. If he loses Dunkley, he's in trouble. They're obviously favourites, even though the Liberals have picked up a great candidate in this fellow, Nathan Conroy, who's a very popular mayor. But Labor will probably win that by-election. But, yeah, that's why he's doing it, Andrew. Well, I don't know. Look, it's, um, we've got the big backflip from the Victorian opposition now, of course. Uh, they're saying, well, before they said we're going to have the... Uh, we're going to back this treaty between the Victorian government and uh, Aboriginal groups, a treaty that will involve things like land and resources and things like that. The government, the opposition now says, ah, maybe not. Here's the Nationals leader. Uh, I've raised with the First Peoples Assembly, the previous previous First Peoples Assembly and the current First Peoples Assembly and their co-chairs, that we have major concerns, particularly around how cultural heritage is working or not working in Victoria. And we want to see those issues resolved before we move on to the next lot of discussions. David, my problem with that is that if you're going to argue that with the ABC fully in favour of a treaty and things like that, you've got to do it with moral conviction. And you don't say we're doing it because oh, there's problems with uh, cultural heritage delays the big business. You know, people not, uh, Aboriginal groups not turning up for three months at a trot, holding up a project. You say no to racism, no to treaties. Do you think the government, uh, the opposition has made a good move? Is it arguing it as it should? Well, as you'll see by the backdrop, uh, I'm in Sydney, so I'll leave these issues uh, largely to, uh, to Victorians to comment on. But I will say this, I think what Australians want and what Indigenous people want overwhelmingly is practical action over symbolism and we saw that demonstrated through the voice referendum and I think a lot of these politicians would be wise to do what Tony Abbott did when he was Prime Minister and spent a significant amount of time in Indigenous communities, away from our capital cities, away from our parliament and let their decisions on these key issues be guided by those experiences. Michael, uh, argue with more conviction, more moral passion, say it's a moral issue. Well, say, you know, stand on a principle, Andrew. I mean, the world is in a situation where people want... People have got conviction. They want politicians that stand for something, who are going to risk their careers by taking firm stands. It's not a time for indecision. It's not a time for weakness, muddle-headedness. Muddle and, you know, on this issue in particular, the Victorian opposition, I wish they would come out and simply say they are opposed to dividing the country by race forever and a country cannot make, as John Howard said many years ago, you can't make a treaty with yourself. And so if you do implement a treaty or argue for a treaty, you're actually saying we are two Australians, we're not one Australia. Well, that was rejected in the voices we saw, Andrew, overwhelmingly. Absolutely. Um, big news this morning from America, Ron DeSantis, the Florida governor, who was uh, Donald Trump's big rival to be the Republican's candidate in the US election in November. Campaign hit the wall, he's given up and is now endorsing Donald Trump. Here he is. It's clear to me that a majority of Republican primary voters want to give Donald Trump another chance. They watch his presidency get stymied by relentless resistance, and they see Democrats using lawfare this day to attack him. Trump is superior to the current incumbent, Joe Biden. That is clear. I signed a pledge to support the Republican nominee, and I will honor that pledge. He has my endorsement because we can't go back to the old Republican guard of yesteryear, a repackaged form of warmed-over corporatism that Nikki Haley represents. 
No, that just does leave that uh, Nikki Haley, the former UN ambassador uh, to the U uh, US ambassador to the UN, as the only serious mm. person that, but she's so far behind. Mm. This makes Donald Trump, Michael, uh, almost unbeatable. In the in the Republican primary, probably, and probably in the election, he'll, he'll he looks like now his favourite to win. And, but that's another example, Andrew. People didn't want a half baked Trump or a half Trump or a third of Trump. They decided, I'll vote for the authentic <laughs> thing. I'll give it real. I'll thing. actually vote for the real thing. Passion and conviction will win you an Correct. election. Michael Correct. Kroger, Dave Hughes, thank you both so much for your time.